In this tutorial, which sounds a bit like a Jane Austen novel gone wrong, we're looking at salts and solubility. The first aim is to describe the rules of solubility, then explain how we prepare useful insoluble salts, and then finally explain how we use precipitate reactions and flame spectroscopy to identify unknown chemicals. Let's start by introducing the idea of solubility by showing you a quick video clip. So you can see I'm putting salt into water, stirring it, and it dissolves because salt is soluble. When soluble substances dissolve in water, they make a solution. Now if I try the same with pepper, you can see the pepper doesn't dissolve, it stays there. Pepper is insoluble in water. We can apply our knowledge of solubility when we're looking at how to make salts. Salts are incredibly useful chemicals that we can profit from. Many salts are found naturally dissolved in seawater. Unlike the sand, which is insoluble, it does not dissolve in the seawater. And that's handy because if it did, some of the cations would be pretty rubbish. But salts have many far-reaching applications. For example, we can use salts to colour our fireworks. Salts are an important ingredient in many, many drugs and medications. We use salts in fertiliser. We use salts in cleaning products. And of course, we use salts as flavour enhancers for our food. So preparing and selling salts is a vital part of a professional chemist's job. Before we can make use of salts, we must first understand solubility rules. In other words, the rules that govern whether a salt dissolves in water or remains insoluble. So you can see from this video that I'm going to make a soluble salt solution. And you can see that it's clear. This is an indication that the salt has dissolved successfully in water to form a solution. So soluble salts produce clear solutions. They can be coloured, but they're still transparent. Whereas insoluble salts are produced in precipitate reactions and they appear cloudy. You can see this one, you can see some sparkling sort of almost golden like fl snowflakes. This is another precipitate reaction. So just have a look again, you can see two soluble salt solutions and I'm reacting them together and you're getting an insoluble precipitate, an insoluble salt. You know this because it's powdery and light cannot pass through it, it reflects light. But what are the rules of solubility? Let's start off with the most useful rule. Remember this word, span. The spar part of this word represents sodium, potassium and ammonium, and the N represents nitrate. What this useful little word teaches us is that any compound that begins with sodium, potassium, ammonium, or any compound that ends with nitrate will be soluble, no exceptions. Learning just this should help you in most solubility questions when you're looking at reactions. However, there are a few others you should pay attention to. Any compound that ends with chloride or sulfate will also be soluble, except for silver chloride and lead chloride, and except for lead sulfate, calcium sulfate, and barium sulfate. Take a special notice of these insoluble salts, silver chloride and barium sulfate, because they come up in exams quite frequently. Barium sulfate is of particular interest and use. We can use it to diagnose whether someone has a tumour in their gut. Patients will swallow what they call a barium meal. It'll either be a food or most likely a drink. That drink contains barium sulfate. Barium sulfate is insoluble in water, so it just forms an opaque powder. So you can see barium sulfate is opaque, and therefore when x-rays are fired at the gut, it reflects the x-ray so you can form an image on a screen. You see, it almost turns the gut into almost something like a bone. So patients consume a barium meal or drink, and also barium is toxic, but yet still it's safe to consume because it's not dangerous as it isn't absorbed into the bloodstream, as it's insoluble, so it just passes through the digestive system. This, again, is an example you will need to refer to in exams. However, all carbonates and hydroxides are insoluble unless, of course, you stick sodium, potassium or ammonium in front of them. So those are the solubility rules, but I would focus mainly on remembering these, silver chloride and barium sulfate. It's not that they can't test you on others, it's just these are the most commonly tested salts. So why are these rules useful? Well, you can use precipitate reactions to produce insoluble salts that are useful, but you need to know which soluble salt solutions to pick to react together to make an insoluble salt. So you just have to pick two correct soluble salts. The best thing to do is start off with the insoluble salt you want to get. So let's say I want to make the useful insoluble salt barium sulfate. From this, I can determine what reactants must have reacted together to make barium sulfate. I know that one of the reactants would have had to have started with the metal barium, and the other one would have had to end it with sulfate, the non-metal part. Remember that salts are ionic compounds, so they contain a metal part and a non-metal part. Once I've established that, 
All I have to do is stick something onto the end and the beginning that makes it a soluble salt solution. Now, if you stick a nitrate on the end of anything, it becomes soluble. And if you stick either potassium, sodium, or ammonium at the beginning of a compound, then it makes that soluble. So remember how useful span is. I'm using it here. So barium nitrate is soluble, potassium sulfate is soluble. But when they react together, I'll make the insoluble salt barium sulfate. So you can see that barium sulfate has been produced, the insoluble part. But I also make potassium nitrate. Potassium from this part and nitrate from this part. So you can see all they're doing is swapping dance partners. Barium is teaming up with sulfate and potassium is teaming up with nitrate. Have a go yourself. What would you have to react together to make silver chloride? Pause and see if you can figure it out by using the solubility rules. Once again, silver and chloride, the first compound must contain silver, the second one must contain chloride. They must both be soluble, so let's just stick a nitrate onto the end of silver, just like I did before. That's now soluble, and let's put a sodium in the front. It could have been potassium, it could have been ammonium, but I'm choosing sodium, and that makes this compound soluble. So when they react together, they swap dance partners, so I get silver chloride over here and sodium nitrate over here. Remember, the metal always comes first, then the non-metal. That is how we describe the rules of solubility. Now let's look at one of the most popular chemistry questions in the C2 paper. That is, how you make a pure dry sample of insoluble salt. Sometimes it asks, how do you prepare a pure dry sample of insoluble salt? Sometimes this question is worth four marks, sometimes it's worth six marks. It's just about remembering a process. The first thing you have to do is choose two appropriate soluble salts, for example, lead nitrate and potassium iodide. Next, you have to dissolve each salt separately in pure water. So you can see that here I'm dissolving a salt. Next, you mix the two salt solutions together to make an insoluble precipitate. So here I've got lead nitrate and potassium iodide, two soluble salt solutions. And I'm going to react them together to make an insoluble precipitate. So you can see that there, and then we can see the insoluble precipitate forming. So if you remember the swapping the dance partner rule, we've made lead iodide and potassium nitrate. Lead iodide is the yellow insoluble precipitate. Just so you know, you wouldn't actually do this one in lab because it's quite a dangerous chemical. Then you get some filter paper and you filter the solution to separate the solid precipitate from the solution. So here's the filter paper and you can see that the soluble watery part has come out, the solution's down here, but the insoluble precipitate it stays in the filter paper. Then you wash through with more water to get rid of any impurity. So if there's anything else in there which could dissolve in water, you need to get rid of it. So you run water over it, rinse it with water, dissolves in the water and goes through into the solution over here, leaving a more pure version of your insoluble precipitate. And then finally, you just leave the precipitate to dry on your filter paper. So here it is drying. So remember, just get two soluble salt solutions, react them together to make a precipitate, filter it, then wash through with more water, then leave to dry. If you even say it like that, you'll get most of the marks. And that is how we explain how we prepare useful insoluble salts. Finally, and the most challenging part, how do we test for positive and negative ions using our understanding of solubility? If you remember, salts, which are ionic compounds, contain a metal part, and the metal part always forms positive ions, and the non-metal part, which forms negative ions. So here we have copper chloride as an example of an ionic compound. The copper will form positive ions, and chloride will form negative ions. So what I'm saying is, how do we test for the positive metal ions and negative non-metal ions. Well, you start by dissolving the salt in water to make a solution. And when you do that, the ions separate out. So you can see that the um, copper ions are not bonded to the chloride ions. They're free floating and swimming around in the solution. And now that they're separated, we can test them. There are two types of tests you need to be aware of. Firstly, you use flame tests or flame test spectroscopy to test for metal ions, positively charged ones, and you use precipitate reactions to test for negative ions. So in this specific example, I'll be testing for copper ions using flame testing and chloride ions using precipitate reactions. First, let's look at flame testing. What you start off with is a wire loop, which you then dip into some acid to clean it and then remove it. In school labs, we usually use weak hydrochloric acid. Next, you dip the wire loop into the unknown ionic compound solution. And obviously, some of that liquid containing the ions will stick to the wire loop. When you remove the wire loop, those ions will still be on it. So you can see copper ions there. Next, you hold the wire loop over a Bunsen burner flame and observe the color change. 
Different metal ions will change this flame different colours. Here are the ones you need to know. Copper turns the flame bluish green, so copper ions turn it blue green. Sodium ions turn the flame orangey yellow. Potassium ions change the flame a lilac, a purpley lilac colour. You say lilac. And I couldn't get calcium, but calcium ions turn the flame brick red. These are the four you must commit to memory. But because the solution I was testing contained copper ions, I'd expect a blue-green flame, like you can see here. Be aware that sometimes metal ions cannot be identified through flame tests alone. That's because some metal ions produce very similar colour flames. For example, calcium and lithium both produce a red flame. This is when you can use spectroscopy. If you remember from the P1 tutorial where we're looking at space and spectroscopy, basically a spectroscope splits up the light emitted from these elements into a pattern of lines. We call a line spectra, and we can use this to identify the element. Don't worry too much, you can just talk about flame tests in C2 anyway, and you should be fine. So we've used flame tests to identify the copper ion because it turned the flame green. But how do we identify the negative ion, the chloride ions? Well, for this we need a completely different type of test we call precipitate reactions. And that's because a precipitate will form, which will indicate the ion in the solution. So this table contains everything you need to know about precipitate reactions for your exam. There are only three negative ions you need to test for. Chloride ions, sulfate ions and carbonate ions. Obviously all of them are non-metals. You can see the ionic formula here. So let's look at how you test for chloride ions first. You start off by squirting a little bit of dilute nitric acid, that's why there's an N in there, nitric acid into the chloride ion containing solution. What will happen then is the nitrate part will separate out and bond to any sort of impurities um, you don't want and make them soluble. This stops you getting any false positive results. In other words, without this, by adding this chemical in here, silver nitrate, to test for chloride ions, it might turn other things into precipitates which weren't chloride ions. So this basically gets you out of that. Don't have to overthink it too much. Just remember, you add dilute nitric acid. The real mark earner comes from understanding the chemical you react it with. So chloride ions, you will react with silver nitrate. You know that silver nitrate is soluble because it ends with nitrate. And you will get silver chloride being produced. This will show itself as a white precipitate, a white cloudy substance. For sulfate ions, you use dilute hydrochloric acid and the chloride will bond to impurities and make them soluble so you don't get any false positives. Uh, but this time you react with barium chloride and this will produce barium sulfate and this is also a white precipitate. In other words, a white powdery solid substance. And finally, carbonate ions. Well, you can get a carbonate and you can put some dilute acid and this will actually liberate carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide can be tested for with lime water, which will turn cloudy. It turns cloudy because it forms calcium carbonate, because lime water can, is basically a calcium hydroxide. So the calcium reacts with the carbonate to form calcium carbonate, which is also a white precipitate. But clearly for copper chloride, I need to test for chloride ions. So what I would say is, first I add a bit of dilute nitric acid. Then I react it with silver nitrate, which will produce the white precipitate silver chloride. You see, the white powder will only form using silver nitrate if chloride ions are there because you need the silver from the silver nitrate to react with the chloride ions to make silver chloride. So you won't get white powder if chloride ions aren't in there because you will not make silver chloride. So questions like this can be worth up to six marks and they usually target the higher level. So the question could be, for example, how you could show the solution is copper chloride but also sodium sulfate or potassium carbonate. See if you can pause and figure out how you detect these two. Well, the first thing you'd have to say is I dissolve the sodium sulfate in water to make a solution. This will separate the sodium ions from the sulfate ions. Then I dip a wire loop into the solution, hold it under a flame, and it should turn the flame orangey yellow to indicate the presence of sodium ions. That's half the question done, three marks. Now we need to talk about sulfate. In the solution of sulfate ions, I would add a little bit of dilute hydrochloric acid and then react it with barium chloride. This will produce the white precipitate barium sulfate, indicating the presence of sulfate ions. And that's the other three marks. For potassium carbonate, you'd basically do the same thing, but this time the potassium will turn the flame lilac, 
And for the carbonate part, the negative ion, you first add a bit of dilute acid and that liberates carbon dioxide. Then you'd bubble that carbon dioxide into lime water, which will turn cloudy. That's because calcium carbonate is forming, which is the white precipitate. So remember, the only test you're on a compound that you can make from these four metal ions and these three non-metal ions. How we explain how we use precipitate reactions and flame spectroscopy to identify unknown chemicals.